Michael Patrick Shields is on the air. Good morning, world. Good morning, Michigan. A very pleasant Thursday to you. It's Michael Patrick Shields, and President Obama is going to Marquette, Michigan today to promote wireless technology. He is going to tout gains in broadband internet service at Northern Michigan University. And we'll have a chat tomorrow morning with Les Wong, the president of Northern Michigan University, on uh, his visit with the president today. Um, Dave Ajima will join us shortly, too. Apparently, uh, he's a former uh, airline pilot. He's in the Michigan House of Representatives. There was uh, a U.S. air flight that was about to take off, and the passengers heard screaming and banging from the floor below them. Believe it or not, a a baggage handler was stuck in the cargo bay just before takeoff, and uh, they got him out of there. What would have happened to him if they had taken off? We'll talk to Representative Ajima about that, and also about the fact that if you're a college student and you're taking advantage of the, the food assistance bridge card, that may be coming to an end soon, and Dave Ajima says that's just the start of some of the cuts. We're also going to hear Donald Trump with Piers Morgan from last night. Uh, Donald Trump is considering running for president of the United States. Now, John Dingell uh, is not running for Pope. The congressman, the longest serving member in the uh, history of the United States House of Representatives from Dearborn, Michigan and the Ann Arbor area, is uh, clarifying remarks that he made about the city of Detroit's financial woes. The congressman gave the impression to some observers that a state takeover of the city's finances might be a possibility. He said this while he was at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Dingle's now saying he was talking about a partnership with the state, not a financial manager. Here's what he said. I've simply pointed out uh, with great affection and respect for the city that Michigan cannot continue with Detroit in the state in which it is at this time. Uh, Dingle said in an appearance he hasn't yet seen a governor who wants to appoint an emergency financial manager for Detroit. He's 84 years old. He said that he has a better chance of being Pope than Detroit currently has of paying off its long-term debt. And uh, Congressman Dingle said the city of Detroit and the state of Michigan need a working partnership for everyone to succeed. That the state has got to interest itself very actively in the well-being of the city and that our new governor has got to be helpful to our new mayor. Now, City Council pro-, pro Tem Gary Brown in Detroit says there ought not be a state takeover of the city's financial dealings. If anyone has a way of giving incentives that will create jobs, that's what we need. We're, we're willing to partner with anyone that's willing to do that, but we don't need someone to come in and take over our finances. We will talk with Robert Bob, the emergency financial manager for the education system in the city of Detroit. He testified yesterday at a joint House and Senate Education Committee meeting in the Senate hearing room of the Bogey Tower here at the Capitol. Meanwhile, New York Republican Congressman Christopher Lee has issued a statement expressing regret over the harm that his actions may have caused and resigned yesterday. There's a gossip site called Gawker. And it posted a bare-chested photo of Congressman Lee that he sent to a woman he met on Craigslist. Uh, He reportedly told the 34-year-old woman he was single and worked as a lobbyist. And he described himself as a fit, fun, classy guy. The woman Googled his name and realized he'd lied. She then leaked her email exchanges to Gawker. But uh, he's decided to resign. He's married and uh, a congressman. And it's a picture of him shirtless doing sort of a, you know, kind of a muscle pose. And um, I guess, is that bad enough to have to resign because you sent a picture of yourself to a woman and said you were single? I, I don't know. What do you think? 888-900-9966. It's sort of electronic flirting, isn't it? Is electronic flirting enough to get you fired or have you forced out of office? I mean, it's his choice. He wasn't kicked out. He decided to leave the House of Representatives because it was embarrassing. Or maybe is there more to the story he's trying to stop? I don't know. But anyway, 888-900-9966. Do you think he should have stepped down? Now, in the media business, uh, we all know it ain't what it used to be in terms of salaries and that sort of thing. CBS wants Katie Couric to stay in the anchor seat, but they want to pay her significantly less money than she's making. The network has asked Katie Couric to extend her contract through the 2012 elections. It's going to expire in May, her deal. But the new contract would bring the evening news anchor significantly less than the $15 million she's currently pulling in. 
negotiations haven't started, but somehow that information came out that they said, Katie, we'd like you to stay, but at a percentage of the salary you're making. Now, what do you do in that case? I suppose she's marketable. She can probably get another job. But, uh, you know, those anchor chairs don't come easily. That's a high-profile position. Would she be willing to do it for less money? 13 minutes after the hour, a Comstock Park man is free on bond awaiting trial for his role in a crash that seriously injured another driver. It's Andrew Schoenborn, charged yesterday with drunk driving, reckless driving, and violation of the super drunk law. He had a blood alcohol level three times the legal limit in December when he rear-ended a minivan on Fruit Ridge Avenue, ejecting a 60-year-old woman called Bertha Rose when the vehicle hit a tree. He was driving 100 miles an hour. Ford Motor Company is suing Ferrari, the Italian-based automaker. They're suing them for trademark infringement involving the F-150 name. Ferrari uh, named its new Formula One racing car the F-150 and created a website. And uh, the lawsuit says Ford has suffered harm to its F-150 trademark, and they're asking for damages. So look at that. Ferrari trying to copy from Ford. That's pretty cool. Um, Are we Michiganders? Are we Michiganians? Or are we Michiganese? What do you consider yourself? I'm Michiganese. I'm a Michigander. I'm a Michiganian. Uh, There is a uh, new poll that says 58% of those surveyed say they're Michiganders. 12% prefer Michiganians, and 7% didn't care. This is an interesting uh, group by uh, research by Matt Resch. And uh, so I guess we're going to be Michiganders. Uh, The uh, Michigan... Michigander is what uh, Governor Snyder prefers, by the way. I kind of like Michiganese, but nobody ever talks about that. They say Michiganians are Michiganders. I'm Michiganese. I just have to say I'm from Michigan. That's boring. Uh, (laughs) Like if you're from DeWitt, Michigan, you're a DeWitt idiot. That's a funny way to put it. If you're from Maine, sometimes you say you're a maniac. Cool stuff. Um... (laughs) Taylor Swift is coming to Van Andel Arena this summer on July 28th. She's going to stop in Grand Rapids as part of her Speak Now tour. Tickets are going to go on sale 10 a.m. February 18th at the box offices and Ticketmaster outlet. She's a four-time Grammy winner. And speaking of the Grammys, two of my favorites are going to be on the Grammy show. Christina Aguilera is going to be honoring the Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin, at the Grammy show. And Jennifer Hudson, my best friend from the boat a couple of weeks ago. She's a Grammy winner, too, and an Oscar winner, too, and they're both going to be part of a a segment that's going to be a, they're calling it a Valentine and a Get Well card to Aretha Franklin on the 53rd Annual Grammy Awards. That'll be this Sunday, February 13th, and Monday morning we'll have the uh, tribute to Aretha Franklin because presumably um, she's recovering from illness in Michigan, and she'll be watching on television from Detroit. We never let the birthday of a beautiful woman pass without taking note. Laura Dern is 44. You would have seen her in Jurassic Park and uh, Little Fockers and some other shows, too. Um, Spring Lake, did you like the light show, the holiday light show that's been going on? Well, some residents complained about the spectacle uh, along Heather Court in Spring Lake, and so they had to have a vote, and they've decided to vote to continue. Uh, 14 houses and uh, 200,000 lights on display, all synchronized Christmas music. And it's going to begin on Black Friday and go through Christmas, and the hours will be the same and all that. And the speakers playing the holiday music will be put outside so people can walk around the neighborhood and hear the tunes. So Christmas wins in Spring Lake, Michigan. Uh, Like I said, we'll hear Donald Trump with Piers Morgan coming up uh, next, and we'll also get with Dave Ajima. Don't forget, in the 7 o'clock hour, this is why I am dressed in this red jacket and pink shirt and pink tie. It'll be our annual romance hour because Valentine's Day is coming up. We don't want you to be flat-footed, man or woman, when you're watching because if you disappoint someone or a bunch of people that you love on Valentine's Day, it could be a bummer. So we're going to get you all hooked up with the latest and greatest snazzy Valentine ideas, our romance hour. What is romance and how can you bring it into your relationship or your marriage or wherever you want it? Uh, That is coming up in the next hour. We'll get sports for you, too. And I wanted to let you know, uh, speaking of women, the Inforum Club, which is a significant group of uh, women, it's an alliance. They are having a luncheon with me as the featured speaker February 23rd from 1130 to 130 at the University Club in uh, Lansing. That's right there uh, 
where Forest Acres is, the MSU University Club. I'll be speaking. The luncheon is from 11.30 to 1.30. I'll be talking about my book, Invite Yourself to the Party, and um, we're going to have a good time there for sure. It's Inforum, a professional women's alliance, very well respected. Tickets are $40, non-members $50, and get a table of eight for $450. Just go to inforummichigan.org. And that information will also be on our website at michigantalknetwork.com and our Facebook page. If you're a Facebook friend of mine, Michael Patrick Shields, it's on my um, posting there, or whatever you call it, my, my homepage, right, or my wall. Is that what it is? 18 after the hour, it's in Forum, February 23rd, 1130 to 130 in the Lansing area. Would love to see you there. Invite yourself to the party. We want you to be there. 18 minutes after the hour, is Donald Trump inviting himself to the White House? We'll find out next. It's Michael Patrick Shields. Is uh, Donald Trump serious when he says he's going to run for president? And would he put the name Trump on the side of the White House like he does with all his other buildings? Uh, we'll find out from him in just a minute. First, though, State Representative Dave Agem of the Republican from Granville. He's the Majority Caucus Chair, and he was nice enough to jump out of bed and be with us this morning. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning. I think it's morning. Yeah, sometimes. Which way is up is what happens when that uh, early call go. comes like that. But I understand college students in Michigan who've been using the uh, bridge card for several years for food assistance. Uh, that may come to an end, or they're going to have to really show true need. And you're quoted as saying that's just the beginning of some of the cuts that are coming in Governor Snyder's new budget. Is, is that is that true? That is true. I mean, this, this particular issue that I've been complaining about, at least even to the past administration for several years, that uh, this is not what we should be doing with college kids. And it just happened to be that DHS had a rule that said if a student was uh, just uh, going to college to get his ability or your employment ability up, a better qualification, that would qualify you for a bridge card, which was not what the federal law said, which was not what other states said in their rules and regulations. Because of that, you had a lot of kids just saying, okay, I want a bridge card. It kind of went viral. Huh. Last September, we had about uh, well, close to 26,000 college kids on bridge cards. Some of those needed it, but many of them didn't. And I'm sure that's well about 27,000 now. So uh, that's one issue, but I want people to know what we're trying to do is get people off the system that don't deserve to be on the system, that we're abusing the system. The other part of the bridge card, as you well know, it's, it looks like a credit card. Yeah. It has a four-digit pin on it. So if I have a, have a bridge card that goes on now uh, in a lot of places, is they'll just sell it on the corner for 50, 75 cents on a dollar. Yeah. That person will receive the man's uh, four-digit pin, and he just go ahead and buy food or whatever he wants. Then the individual that receives the cash can buy whatever he wants, including alcohol, booze, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of abuse within the system we're still looking at. Okay, that's uh, that sounds like a good place to start. I mean, I guess in the overall picture, what you're going to start doing is really looking closely at where we're spending money and why we're spending money and how we're spending money, and that should be very interesting. I wanted to ask you, too, um, we, uh, we heard a story this morning that a U.S. air flight was about, and I ask you this because you were an airline pilot, uh, the uh, U.S. air flight was about to take off, and the uh, passengers heard pounding, banging, and screaming coming from below the floor, it turns out there was a baggage handler that accidentally closed up in the belly of the plane, and they almost took off with him down there. Uh, what would have happened to him uh, had they lifted off with the handler in the baggage area? Well, it would depend on which part of the baggage sections he's in, uh, and depends how high they would fly. Uh, there's one part of that that's pressurized. That's where you put, uh, you know, if you have dogs or you're hauling animals or whatever underneath there. It would have got very cold. But if he was in the other section where it's not pressurized, he would probably be dead because uh, there's just no heat, there's no pressure. So if he goes about 15,000, 20,000 feet for an extended period of time, he just pass out and he would die. So well, lucky they got him out of there. Do you ever have any? The forward, the forward portion of that uh, is, is pressurized and the rear portion isn't pressurized. What about this United States congressman now? Uh, Lee is his name. He has decided to resign because he sent a picture of himself uh, shirtless to a 34-year-old woman. He's essentially flirting online with somebody from Craigslist, calling himself fit, fun, and classy. And, he, and the funny part is he claimed to be a lobbyist, which is <laughs> pretty good cover, I guess, for a congressperson. But uh, he's resigned now because it went public. It's on the website and all that. Do uh, you think he should have to quit? I mean, it was his own decision, but should he, is that offense bad enough to resign from the uh, United States House of Representatives? 
Well, let me ask you a question. Was it just a shirt? <laughs> so far, maybe <laughs> there may be more to the story as we always uh, as we always learn. But it doesn't matter if he quit or not. They're going to find the rest of it if there's more of it to find. Twenty seven minutes after the hour. Thank you very much. Travel safely to Washington. Piers Morgan yesterday asked Donald Trump on CNN. Are you considering running for president? And here's what the Donald said. The country is doing very poorly. It just can't do much worse. We're not respected anywhere in the world. I am seriously thinking about it. I won't make a decision till June, but I will make a decision. And it may surprise people, frankly, but I will make a decision sometime prior to June. I love this country. I hate what's happened to this country. We're a laughing stock throughout the world. We're not respected. When you look at what's happening in various places that we've always supported, and frankly, that we got along with, they're the places that are collapsing. You don't see the other places collapsing. A lot of that is a lack of respect for our country peers. And you know how I feel. You know very much how I feel. Um, we just don't have it anymore as a country. You look at what China is doing to us, how they're just ripping us left and right. They're taking our jobs. We're rebuilding China. Worse than China is OPEC. They wouldn't be there except for us. Twelve men sit around the table. They set the price of fuel. They set the price of $3.50 for your car right now, a gallon. Guess what? That's going to be 5 6 and $7 very soon because there's nobody here that calls them and says, fellas, you better not do it. So let me assume that you're president for a moment. And I've got a funny feeling you are going to run because I think you think your time may have come and that there's an opportunity for you, particularly with the Republicans in certain disarray. You know, you have Sarah Palin and you have the moderates and there may well be a middle ground for you to storm through if you wanted to do that. Assume you're president. What are the top priorities for President Trump? Well, I think the first thing I do is announce very strongly that we're going to tax Chinese products, 25 percent tax on all Chinese products. They will come to the table immediately. They will stop manipulating their currency, which they're doing. It's very hard for our companies to compete with China because of the manipulation of their currency. I buy a lot of products. I'm building buildings all over the place. I buy glass and steel and lots of other things. It's very hard for our countries to compete with China. We make better products in them. By the way, that's the most important thing. We make better products. You look at their sheetrock, making people sick and killing people all over the country. Jobs closed up. The, sea, the sheetrock was... You see them as the enemy, don't you, China? I see them as the enemy, yeah. See, and they, I, I, the, by the way, they know, they know they're the enemy. They are the enemy. They say they're the enemy. Yeah, but they're, they're not an enemy in the sense that they don't want to kill you, right? They want to kill you in business. They want to take over this country economically. But that's different to one to kill you, like a, an Al Qaeda or well, something. Well, when I, when you, I hear you say enemy, but it's very bad. No, but when I hear you say enemy, I think it's too strong a word. They're a business competitor who, at the moment, is out competing America, aren't they? They are not really out competing, they're cheating. When you cheat, and we have people that don't know what to do because we have the wrong people in office, that's not out competing. Do you think we have smart enough people to deal with? with the Chinese and the Indians and these new competitors out there in business? I think they're smart, but I don't think they have any savvy. They don't have the savvy. They don't have what it takes. We should put our best business lead. You know who we have negotiating with the Chinese? Diplomats. You know what a diplomat is? A person that from a young age is trained how to be nice. In other words, you could never be a diplomat. Okay? <laughs> but a Everybody said he should be fired. Every week they wanted me to fire this guy. I couldn't fire him because he was so smart. I, didn't well, I wouldn't want to be fire here him. without you. That's right. Yeah, that's <laughs> now, yeah, I mean, you're terrific. Frankly, you'd be a very good negotiator. I'd have you any day. Yeah, but so would you, you see. This is why I'm interested about your presidential uh, possible campaign, because I think we do need people like you running trading negotiations and diplomacy, frankly, with these countries. Because it seems to me at the moment, the Chinese thing, it's not a military threat. It's a business threat, and they are doing it better and faster and cheaper than anybody else in, in the world. I wouldn't call, I went to Shanghai recently. I was just stunned by what I found. 25 million people in that country, in that city, just going crazy for business. And they just wanted to be number one. There are, there are towns in China that sell 95% of the world's duvets. You know, they manufacture 85% of the world's buttons. Now, I don't think that's the enemy. I think it's a potential business friend, isn't it? Can't we work with them? I don't think they're friends. I think they're enemies. I deal with Chinese. I just sold an apartment to a Chinese person for $33 million a short while ago, a couple of months ago. 
I mean, I'm supposed to like the Chinese, but I understand the Chinese, and I deal with them all the time. Now, this is before they thought I might run for president. They consider our leaders extremely stupid people. They cannot believe what they get away with, whether it's the Olympics where they put people underage and they say, no, 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 and then we find out it was true, and they say, oh, we just didn't know, or whether they have the beautiful girl singing the national anthem, their national anthem, but it wasn't her singing. So many different things. I mean, the Chinese are looking to put us under. And believe me, they are not our friends. I'm surprised at you because you're not somebody that's easily misled or misguided. <laughs> well, but, but, I, here's but what I think. They why, are why not our friends. Why can't America do to the Chinese what they do to America, which is they make a lot of goods that Americans want, and they make them cheaply, and they make them fast. Why can't America start going back to its great manufacturing days and actually target in China stuff that they need from America? They need big machinery, for example. That could be made here and that could be sold at a good profit and create jobs in America. But I don't see people in America taking that position. Piers, you have to level the playing field. I buy so many products, glass as an example, a curtain wall for a building, and they all come in. And 90% of the companies with the glass are coming in from China. I don't want to buy glass from China, but our companies can't compete, not because they're not good, not because they're not even better, but because of the fact that the Chinese are manipulating their currency. They make it very, very tough for us to compete. Now, what I would say, how do you solve that problem? They're never going to solve it. They're never going to treat us well unless we do something strong. Here's what happens. This is American glass, by the way. Uh, you don't know that. Um, that's, no, no, it is. It's it actually is, plastic. It is American it's glass. It's actually plexiglass. But glass, plastic okay. glass. It's almost. You're, you're almost. <laughs> Nearly American glass. I feel better with plexiglass. <laughs> but the fact is that the Chinese are looking to do damage to us economically. They're also building up a military. They're now starting their own aircraft manufacturing, which is going to be very bad for Boeing because, you know, they come in with this phony deal about $40 billion worth of airplanes, which is nothing by comparison to what they're cheating us out of. Now, I hate to use strong words, but that's what it is. And if you read the real economists and the real mm -hmm. people that know what's going on, it's an unfair playing field. So here's what happens. You said, what would I do? Mm. I would immediately announce a tax of 25%. The first thing that's going to happen is the Chinese are going to call. So you have a trade war? We don't have free trade. You know, I, I believe in free trade, right? But we don't have free trade. We have very, very unfair trade. I call it unfair trade. I would tax them 25%. They would come to the table immediately. The other thing I'd do is I'd get our best business leaders. I wouldn't use the diplomats. I'd use the killers on Wall Street, of which I know every one of them. I would put this one in charge of negotiating with China. I'd put this one in charge of negotiating with India. We would do very well. We have the greatest business people in the world, but we, we see, don't use I, them. Before we go to a break, let me just put one thing to you. In business, you can be ruthless. I've seen it, and you're successful because of it. You kill competitors, don't you? Aren't the Chinese just behaving like Donald Trump? And don't well, we just need more people like you to compete with them? You need people that know how to deal with the Chinese, and we don't have those people. The president of China comes in, we give him a five-star dinner at the White House. I don't give my, my people that are not fair to me five-star dinners. I wouldn't have given them a five. I would have said, come to my office, let's talk. And if we don't work out a deal, we send them to McDonald's and send them back. <laughs> We're going to come back. Shrek the Musical tells the story of a swamp-dwelling ogre who goes on a life-changing adventure to reclaim the deed to his land. But you know that. You've seen Shrek on the big screen and even on your little screen at home. Now you can see it on the stage at the Wharton Center. Through Sunday, February 13th, call 1-800-WHARTON or go to whartoncenter.com and you'll be able to meet and see Eric Peterson, who plays Shrek, and David Vaughn, who plays Lord Farquaad, and they are both in the studio with us this morning. Nice to see you both. Yeah, good to be here. The early uh, Morning's not a good time for stage performers, is it? <laughs> well, I mean, the show usually comes down around, you know, 1030 or so, yeah. and then we had a cast party last night, and so... It is a little early for us. Do you have a tough time winding down after a, a stage performance? Yeah, it, it takes a little uh, it takes a little while uh, to wind down. You know, like you said, we get out at 10.30. Sometimes we don't get home until 11.30. We're hungry. We eat. Yeah. It's 12 o'clock. It takes a while. Usually, most yeah. of us don't go to sleep before 2. Yeah, yeah I would yeah. think so, because you're, you're, you're probably physically spent and yeah. yet wired at the same time. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, I mean, the, you know, the interaction with the audience gets you kind of 
amped up and then you know you can't just turn it off usually especially at the end of this show we you know we do an entire you know i'm a believer like you just heard and yeah it's it's quite a quite an event yeah do you listen to the level of the applause at the end of the performance and are you sometimes disappointed that it isn't more <laughs> rousing uh yeah i mean i think you you know you can't help but notice you know i don't think that that's why you do it but i think that um you know sometimes we'll come off stage and be like oh they were uh we must not have had our A game on tonight, or or we leave saying, "Wow, we really nailed it tonight." But I mean, you definitely notice the difference between audiences. And every audience is different. You know, some audiences that you know, especially with regionally, sometimes you get to a town that they are just a little more respectful and a little more reserved, mm -hmm. uh, and then you get to some towns where they are jumping up and down the aisles. Huh. Yeah. Is that the moment? Is that the payoff when you go out for the bow? No, I, I think the payoff, the payoff is. Yeah, I think the bigger payoff actually, especially for David and I, because we're comedic actors yeah. you know is really landing a joke you yeah. know is, is you get more satisfaction from like really finessing a joke and really like working an audience and you know with some sort of slide gesture or, you know in intonation or something like that inflection and uh that's really where i think the payoff comes more so than the bow at the end the bow at the end is just kind of like yeah hey, yeah we're done and it's icing. yeah yeah it's icing the miller time yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. exactly do you ever crack yourself up on the even though you've done oh. it over and over and over <laughs> absolutely yeah. i would I'd say especially with eric and i we're you know we've been friends for a while and we did the broadway show together and yeah i i can't think of a day that goes by that we don't somehow crack each other up really yeah. oh yeah i mean constantly yeah. you know because we're always messing a with lot each of other. biting of lips on stage yeah then. yeah because you it's, tinker with it a little bit oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean yeah, it's different every night. You know, so. the show is the show is also fluid. You know, we we change things depending on what city we're in. Uh, if something political happens, a lot of times I'll change some of my lines to make oh. them kind of you know. No kidding. Because that's you know that's some of the beauty of the movie too is they mix this classical medieval fairy tale. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, is Les Miserables the greatest uh, stage show ever performed? No, absolutely not. <laughs> no, no, I've done I've done the show and I've seen it and uh, it's not the best. It's great. It's very uh, Shrek the musical. Is Shrek the, the musical best. is okay, <laughs> uh, but both very very epic. Then, um, so uh, uh, young people are welcome. Mm -hmm. yes. Come to this show and encouraged, right? Yeah, I think you know what I think is funny is that uh, I think so often our show is kind of viewed as a kids show, which is it is to an extent. You know, kids are going to come and they're going to love it, um, but there's also a lot of adult humor in it, mm -hmm. um, which I think uh, is shocking to people sometimes. Not shocking in like an appalled way, but just they, yeah. they, they don't expect it. Um, like I a little present for the yeah, adult. I can't, yeah, I can't tell me. you how many times people you know will come talk to us after the show and be like. I came because my kids wanted to see the show, but I had like the best time. You know, well, my last night said that she came up to yeah. us said the exact thing. That's why I like to say this show is a family show. Yeah, and 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 in that sense, where you know the kids and the adults are literally belly laughing next to each other because the you know the adult just heard some really great sports reference to you know the Super Bowl or whatever, yeah. and uh, you know the kids saw Shrek fart. You know? Yeah, <laughs> well, Shrek was one of the first. Uh, movies to do that, right? As, yeah. as I recall, in a Disney movie where they, they made it mine. Yeah, I mean, they they kind of try to take, you know, the fairy tales and fracture them a little bit and kind of give something to the adults and the and the kids. And they also like to, you know, DreamWorks likes to stick it to Disney every yeah. once in a while. <laughs> so, you know, they like to they like to poke fun at them. Yeah. And we uh, do that the same in the stage show. Because yeah. it's a little more loose and a little more yeah. fast and yeah. a little yeah. more uh, a little sardonic more sometimes yeah, even. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, congratulations to both of you. And thanks for coming to Frigid, Michigan. What, Thank you. Wh where is your uh, favorite city? to stop in. I know you were in, on Broadway, so New York, New York's tough to follow, but <sighs> I mean, when you come out into the heartland, the flyover I, states. Oh, yeah. no, 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 no. I'm he, from Chicago no. originally, and we oh, opened right. the tour there, so I was I enjoyed being there. That must have been a gas. How about yeah. you? I, I, you know, I, I don't know why, but I love Denver so much. No kidding. It's such a great city. You know, we're also going to L.A. in the summer, which mm -hmm. I'm sure will be really great. Yeah. Uh, so we get, you know, we get to, you know, see every city pretty much in the nation, yeah. and that's a lot of fun because, you know, even though it's cold here, it's, it's a different place, and it's fun to kind of explore. and New people. Yeah. Yeah, well, you can li you can be on campus again for a couple of uh, yeah. yeah. days. A couple days, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, Eric Peterson and David Vaughn will be on stage Sunday at the Wharton, well, through Sunday at the Wharton Center for Shrek the Musical. Great to meet you. Thanks and so break much. a leg. Thanks thank so you. much. Ten minutes before the hour, by the way. You know, one of the number one stories of the week and one that we'll be watching with uh, curiosity until we get to 11-11-11 Veterans Day is that the Michigan State Spartan basketball team is going to go play on an aircraft carrier in San Diego Harbor. It's been a long time dream and now wish and now reality for the very creative Michigan State University Athletic Director Mark Hollis, and he joins us this morning. Good morning to you. 
Good morning. How are you doing this morning on this chilly mid-Michigan morning? Oh, yeah, it's a good day. This is why basketball is played in the winter, because you got a cold day. You get going to a warm, bright gym with the Izone going strong and the band, and everybody feels good for a couple of hours. It's a, it's a tradition in Michigan. And uh, it will be an outdoor game, I presume, on that aircraft carrier. San Diego's got the finest climate in the world there. They call it America's finest city. But this is a silly question, but what, you're going to play North Carolina. Is there movement uh, when the boat is in the water? I call it a boat. It's a ship. Uh, w- will the floor move a little bit, or are those things so big that they're pretty solid? Well, they're like a, a major city. I mean, it's, it's something where you feel absolutely no movement. Uh, Roy Williams and I and a, a couple other folks were out there uh, in December, and uh, I've had an opportunity to be on a carrier many times when I was with Dr. Kearney out in the uh, – Western Athletic Conference for many of the holiday bowl games. They were the site for uh, a lot of the gathering of the football teams for that event. So we're making a lot of progress. We anticipate that the uh, the official announcement with all of the different activities will be uh, sometime by the Final Four this year, and uh, we're really looking forward to it. But a little bit more work to do, but everything is uh, – in the right direction, as they say. Yeah, pardon the pun, right? Um, now, 6,000 people, I'm told, will be uh, seated in some sort of makeshift stands. Most of those people are going to be enlisted men and women and their families, but there will be some access. And how, how will you decide who gets to go from Michigan State? Well, there will be some access, and obviously uh, there will be uh, guest tickets for the, uh, the parents, for their families, the immediate family members. And then uh, some of the donors uh, will be dropped into that category. It's you know, we won't be selling tickets. It's uh, you can't sell tickets for a uh, an event on a military or a government installation. So it's it's something where the tickets will uh, will not be sold, but they'll be made available to those that uh, that support uh, Spartan Athletics, Tar Heel Athletics, and uh, you, you kind of got to step back and look at the reason why our numbers are so low. The the purpose for this uh, is to celebrate those men and women and their families. Uh, that put their, themselves downrange in harm's way to protect this nation. And, you know, it's an opportunity, I think, for those of us that enjoy that freedom um, to kind of reach out, and hopefully this will turn into a national celebration through the NCAA of 11-11-11 of as a day that the NCAA and college athletics uh, really reaches out to those, those individuals that, uh, that protect us every day. Has this ever been done before? Um, I don't believe so. Not at this. Not at this level. I mean, ESPN, which is one of the uh, the outfits that we're talking to as far as television, did a great event last Veterans Day, and I think it's something that could tie very nicely into uh, into this. We're we're looking at not only a basketball game, but also a uh, a pretty major concert that would take place on the ship on the court uh, for these folks right at the conclusion of the game with a, a three-hour television uh, celebration. So it's going to be a pretty unique event. Mm. Uh, I understand, too, you're uh, going to recruit or hope to draw a number of celebrities? Yeah, it's, you know, we've already reached out and heard back from some, but it's uh, Mike Whalen, who is uh, the head of uh, Morale Entertainment, which is kind of the, uh, the third party in this whole process. He, he's taken football coaches into Baghdad, including uh, Coach Trussell last year from Ohio State. So it takes about six coaches every year into Baghdad. He's taken uh, Indy Drivers. Um, onto ships that are downrange in the in the Gulf, and you know this is his forte, and and some of the things that that he's brought to the brought to the dance, so to speak, is to reach out to actors who have played key roles in uh, military-based uh, movies. That uh, you know, if you look at the Cuba Downing or Cuba Gooding, you look yeah. at uh, uh, people like Tom Cruise, uh, and it's going to be a pretty unique uh, collection of people. You know, Magic Johnson has already confirmed that. Uh, he wants to be part of a two-day celebration, and, and his idea was to have a clinic with him and maybe a prominent alum from North Carolina uh, for the young kids uh, of, the, uh, of the base there that you know, are missing their fathers and, and mothers right now that may be overseas. Yeah, maybe Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson can have a game of 21 or something, or a horse or something <laughs> like that. That would be pretty entertaining. Yeah. Um, and you know what it speaks, though? It speaks to the fact that Michigan State really is one of America's teams, one of very few uh, when it comes to college basketball, the brand is right up there with the North Carolinas and the Dukes. And after that, I don't even know. Those are like the three most prominent college basketball teams in America, don't you think? Well, you know, what's interesting is, is the team will actually be out there on the uh, on Friday playing, and they'll head right to New York City. So it's almost a coast-to-coast type deal where we'll be playing Duke 
uh, in Madison Square Garden as part of an event called the Champions Challenge. And that is supposedly the four uh, prominent basketball schools in the country that are going to play a three-year series in three different cities. And you add to Michigan State, Duke, um, Kentucky, and uh, Kansas, and you're going to see those four programs rotate from New York City um, to Chicago to Atlanta and play a three-year set where we'll each play each other once during that three-year span. So there are very prominent schools out there, I think, you know, even with the season that we're having, um, I don't judge programs by seasons or games, but by the program, and, and it is very solid. Well, congratulations. Anchors away. We'll talk to you before then, but we're very proud of Michigan State and the Spartans. They'll be playing in San Diego on an aircraft carrier on Veterans Day. What a scene that is going to be. And that's uh, MSU Athletic Director Mark Hollis. I'm Michael Patrick Shields. Good morning, Michigan. A very pleasant Thursday to you. Maybe the most romantic movie in history, Casablanca, and we're going to have the most romantic hour in show business history right now, in radio anyway. It's our annual pre-Valentine's Day show. We don't want anyone caught flat-footed when the day of romance comes at the weekend, so stay tuned for this hour. You're going to meet people who are going to help you with creative and fun ways to make any night unforgettable. Valentine's Day do's and don'ts, and how to celebrate all five senses for a relaxing, sensual evening maybe too, charming dinner, picnics, romantic getaways, how to keep the spark alive in your relationship year after year, why the brain is the sexiest part of your body and how to engage it, romantic advice from food to toys to jewelry to wine, you name it, it's all going to happen in this next hour, our romance hour. Is it schmaltzy? I hope so, because you got to have a little fun in life, and we've assembled a panel. Uh, Some will be here in the studio with us and some will be on the telephone from parts all around the world. And we'll go uh, left to right in our round table here and have uh, our guests, our romantic guests, say who they are, where they're from, and a little bit about them. And we'll start on my left here. This is a strapping man in a brown suit and tie with a big smile on his face, sir. Happy pre-Valentine's Day to you. Thank you for having me there, Michael Patrick Shield. I'm Dwayne Gill, uh, world's funniest cop on uh, the show today to tell you how to uh, bring a little spark back into Valentine's Day. and Because and, all women do love a sense of humor. They love diamonds, too. But a sense of humor can do it for them. So. <laughs> That's what I always hear the chicks say. He's so funny. Yeah, yeah, as they as they put that thong on. So anyway. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, no, they'll often say. You see been... where we're going with this, just so you know. <laughs> I'm over here making jokes, all right? <laughs> no, you're, you're a comedian. You travel all around doing stand-up shows, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, Valentine's weekend is always a good weekend for couples to come out to the comedy club, get a little laugh before they go home and, and get buck wild. So, you know, it's it's going to be fun. I'm really Are looking forward to this weekend. suggesting that uh, laughter is an aphrodisiac? Absolutely. If the brain is the biggest and most sexiest part of the body, obviously I've got it. So, <laughs> <laughs> Did you say the biggest part of the body or the sexiest part of the body? Second biggest part of the body, <laughs> Michael Patrick Shields. So. Well, if you got big hands and big feet, you know what that means? You got big hands and big feet. You got big shoes and big gloves. That's, right. That's what that means exactly. <laughs> now, you do stand up all over, and you are on the television now, too, on Nationwide. Yes, I was I was in a couple of episodes of Detroit 187. Oh. I'm very happy to do that. And, uh, you know, just kind of expanding things. So, But I'm having fun, Mike. Right? Yeah. Yeah, and then now speaking of expanding things, does that work with the chicks? You know, I'm on network television. See me on ABC. Well, I'm I a... wish, you know, but my wife is married, so. Oh, she uh, is. <laughs> okay. Well, congratulations yeah. to her. Yeah, 21 years this time. Oh, okay. So uh, <laughs> it's working out so. Does far. she still think you're a doctor? Uh, yeah, yeah. Hey, she, she's mad at me because I bought her a snowblower for Valentine's Day. So it's, that's romantic. Yeah, I think so. I wanted to get done doing the snow so she can come in and make me dinner. Yeah, so. and keep the fireplace going and all <laughs> that's that. That's right. No, that's beautiful. Beautiful. Boy, that's chivalrous, <laughs> I would say. Now, you were, uh, if we can talk about this part of your life, you're a, a state police officer. Yes, I am, full-time. And uh, Christy Etchu is a very good friend of the program. Oh, we're happy good. for have the yep. first uh, female commander of the Michigan State Police. You don't mind working for a woman, do you? No, I don't mind working for a woman at all. I, I That's, you know, Colonel Etchu, if she's listening, hey, thank you for uh, uh, having me on the job. It's, it's all good, okay. absolutely. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you is you were a security detail for Governor Angler and Michelle Angler. Right, Governor Angler. And uh, Governor Granholm. Oh, and Governor Five Granholm and too. Years, both. Yep, um, yep. Which which couple was more romantic, or were they both? Oh man, they were both romantic. I you yeah. know I, I can 
I can honestly say both of them actually they'd love each other, all of them. You know, I know you can't give us. Details. I can't give you too many details, but uh, they both couples are very much in love. I got a chance to see Governor uh, Engler at the inauguration and Michelle. Oh, yeah. They're great people, and so are the Grand Homes. So you never uh, walked into the mansion at the wrong time and saw <laughs> rose petals leading from the door all the way to the Again, to the if kitchen. I tell you, I have to kill you, Michael. Oh, okay, and you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> They'll let you. All right. Well, thank you very much. I thought uh, I want to pass this to you. This was uh, given to me uh -huh. by uh, my wife, Dr. Christine Teneglia, the dentist. This oh. is a, uh, as you can see, it's a prop for, we've got candles, we've got chocolates, oh, we got we've everything. got food yeah. and wine here on the table with us. Amanda Wall is, is still a newlywed after two years of being married. If you would, and, and make sure that uh, the television cameras can see that, because I want you to hold that by the microphone, if you would, Okay. and uh, Press the push the button. Oh. Yeah, Aww. Dwayne, we love you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> and we love all you're doing for Michigan. Amanda, if you could bring that back over <laughs> here. Oh, you could take it away. <laughs> oh, no, uh, why don't you pass it over to Matt Rhodes. Oh, you and go, you man. hold that. This is a, uh, for those on radio, this is a, a big, like, stuffed animal-type rose. Will you push that button for you, Matt, there? Yeah, You're so we, lucky, Michael. we don't want you yeah. to be left out either because we love you too, especially uh, what you've brought us. Yeah, now, brought Dwayne says laughter is an aphrodisiac, but uh, you've got the chemical portion. That's right. We got the wine portion. So we brought a bottle of uh, Italian, uh, Italian, Australian uh, pink Moscato uh, by Innocent Bystander. So pink Moscato. Lightly, a little frizzante to it, uh, lightly sweet, low alcohol, just five and a half percent. So just a nice, easy drinking bottle. Pinkish too, like my shirt. Well, that'd be red, Michael. That uh, that <laughs> looks like, but it has a cap on it that I don't usually see. It looks like a uh, like a beer bottle cap. Yeah, exactly, because it just has like a half sparkle to it. So it's not a true champagne. It's not a still wine. It's right in between. So uh, they put that on just for uh, a little. So it could come with a cork, but uh, they do this just for a different look and make it kind of special looking. It's a bit of a tickle, then, is it? Is exactly. that what it is? Yep. Just to get yeah. things going. Would you drink that before dinner or after? Uh, either either one. So, yeah. Dusty Cellar is where you can find Matt. It's dustycellar.com. Uh, if you look online anywhere in the state, it's on Grand River, a little east of the Meridian Mall. What do you think is, why does wine invoke feelings of romance more than, say, whiskey <laughs> <laughs> or beer? Whiskey wants you to fight, right? <laughs> <So wine laughs> is romance. Or vodka. Oh, I'm just a little biased because I'm in the wine industry primarily. So, no, just wine definitely has a, a romantic feel to it and uh uh, history, as you mentioned, the movies earlier, going back through lots of movies, and uh, you know people remember lots of occasions based on the wine they had. Well, wine is fine, but liquor is quicker. <laughs> there you go. Isn't that true, Dwayne? <laughs> Absolutely, I could have said it better. I think between you and Dwayne, I'm in trouble. Too. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna need but some help over here from. Uh, romance is though uh, something that you really can't rush through. Oh, absolutely. Can not. you? No. It's not like, <laughs> brace yourself, Ethel. There has to be some more, uh, you know, uh, development. When, <laughs> champagne is very uh, romantic, too, isn't it? Absolutely. Champagne's a wonderful Valentine's gift. So. Would you recommend? Now, there's a now there's a Michigan champagne that would be perfect for Valentine's Day. I think you know the one I'm talking about. The Larry Mauve? Yeah. Does it have a certain name, Michael? It does. What is it? It's called Sex. The wine. <laughs> the, sh the champagne. It's not champagne. It's sparkling wine. Exactly. Yep. Uh, by, by Larry Mauve, he makes a few as he makes uh, Sex, uh, Fizz, Wet, Blanc de Blanc. So a wonderful wine of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. And that's called... That's wine? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, in the, come on the, in, Dwayne. In, yeah. the, 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 what order do the oh, sex, the fizz, and the wet have to come in? That's wow. the question. I knew I was in trouble today. <laughs> we are on the radio. To be on, and television, too. Yeah. To be honest, though, the uh, it, it has to be from the Champagne region of France to technically be called Champagne. But it's the same sort of drink if it's sparkling wine. Yeah, too. anything else would be, if it's made in the Champagne method, it's just called Method Champenoise if it's from somewhere outside of France, outside of Champagne district within France. Oh my gosh, can you say that again? Yeah, Method Champenoise. Ooh, I got tingling. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> that, speaking that French, that's a little romantic Ooh. too, isn't it? So, But otherwise, it's made in the same way, different parts of the world. But How much French do you speak? That's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Merci, monsieur. That's it. That's it. Uh, down in the third, but let's go straight down into the third base position. Katrine Medawar from Medawar Jewelers. They say, what is a girl's best friend? Diamonds. Diamonds are a girl's best friend, in your case, with uh, locations in Portage and uh, on uh, Grand River. Very near a dusty cellar, near the Meridian Mall. And 
across from the Lansing Mall in West Lansing and, and Jackson. Uh, you speak lo- fluent French, do you not? Well, I can't say it's fluent, but I have been going to Paris lately, and so I've had the opportunity to uh, practice my French with my <laughs> friends. Would you give us a, a couple of paragraphs? On paragraphs? W- yes, <laughs> on <laughs> why, on, on, in the last minute of the segment. All in French on why diamonds or jewelry are a perfect Valentine's gift. Oh, I don't know that I can do that, Michael. We don't. We won't know what you're saying. Just <laughs> say as much French as you possibly can. <laughs> Doesn't even matter. <laughs> yeah, je vous aime beaucoup. No, well, I will. Où tell you, toi? Je suis du Liban, so I am originally Lebanese, and most of the Lebanese speak a little bit of French, mm-hmm. English, and of course Arabic. And um, I love Arabic also. Arabic is a beautiful language, but French has a little something to it. So I will say at the end of this segment, je t'aime beaucoup. Mm. Could you say it again six times in a row? (laughs) (laughs) Je ne sais quoi. Yeah, there's a je ne sais quoi, uh, bon appétit. I I have to reach for anything I can get at this stage. French, palm frites. (laughs) Isn't it? Palm frites is French fries. Okay, we'll come back with... Hopefully some understandable English language. The next sense we're going to is food, and everybody can probably agree that the the way to a man's heart, Dwayne, is through his stomach. And that's where we'll go next on the Romance Hour. At 18 minutes after the hour, it's Michael Patrick Shields back in four minutes of heartbeats. It's our uh, Romance Hour, and uh, Dr. John Chrysler, you had a follow-up. You're with AllThingsMail.com. You were talking about the, the tantric nature of romance. Katrine's uh, student observation. By the way, Metawars is good not just for uh, romance, but also for getting a guy out of the doghouse. Yeah. <laughs> Having said that, what does a woman consider foreplay? Taking out the trash without being asked. Think of the dishes after dinner. Yes. Right. A little kiss on the cheek. Uh, a little whisper in the ear saying, you know, thank you for this. Thank you for thinking about me. Thank you for doing that. I think also, not just this, John, but you'll agree with me, we like... We, la- we like love. We like romance during the day, don't we? I'm sure Officer uh, Gilbert here would uh, agree with me that uh, women need romance and guys need a place to do it. Yeah. <laughs> What's, uh, <laughs> what is it for a man? If it's, if it's all that stuff for a woman, wh- what is it for a man? Just it, period. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, us guys, we're pretty, we're pretty low maintenance, right? <laughs> like he says, you just need a place. That's all. And a little box, Michael. A little, a little black box. Yes. You know, women just go crazy when they see a little something in that box, whether it's a Pandora bracelet, whether it's a ring, whether it's a pair of earrings. And the price doesn't have to be huge. You can do well, something. Sure, that's what she says now. <laughs> but, John, you know. You can get yes, something. I do know. Yes, you know. For $50 mm-hmm. and make a woman very happy. And that is available right now. Jewelry is accessible to everyone with Pandora oh, in right. the picture. So yeah. there is something for everyone. And Pandora allows you to even be more expressive because you can pick something that represents the person you're giving it to. Absolutely. Pandora is moments and moments that you share with the one you love. And there is a moment for everyone. Uh, sh- uh, she said moments, not seconds, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> <In> moments. <laughs> yeah, try to, try to make it more. Chef, has ever, anyone ever put a diamond ring into some of your food as a way of... Uh, Sure. Glass, ha, has sure. it happened? They bake diamond rings into soufflés. They put really? them under steaks. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. A, a ring under a steak? Sure. That's, that's a new one. <laughs> that sounds a little messy, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, it's, it's, it's all in the process. <laughs> but that's the kind of restaurant that Nibi is in the Firekeeper's Casino where events like proposals would happen, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think we've had well over a dozen since we've opened, which, wow. which is good. And everyone is special. I mean, yeah. it, the staff gets excited, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a romantic situation. Allison Bucknerberg is with us on the other end of our line from DeltaVacations.com because traveling can be very romantic. Allison, happy pre-Valentine's Day to you. Happy Valentine's Day to you as well. well you with DeltaVacations.com have been all over the world. W- name a couple of places that you think are romantic venues that we can get to through Delta Vacations. Um, some of my favorites, of course, are big cities like um, New York City or like Las Vegas. But I think the most, the most romantic for a lot of people um, is by the water, whether it's by big lakes or, um, of course, by the ocean. Places like Hawaii or Mexico or the Caribbean islands where you can kind of, you know, sneak away and spend a lot of time with your significant other um, bathing in the sun and uh, getting sand all over. 
<laughs> Getting sand everywhere, huh, Dwayne? <laughs> <laughs> <There you go. laughs> Don't forget now the rugged, natural, sea-smashed cliffs of Ireland with the wind blowing over the natural grass and the, and the ocean smashing up and the, the rain falling down on top of you. That can be romantic, yeah, too. Yeah, actually, um, you know, they were. I just tweeted on my uh, Twitter account the other day that Ireland's been raised one of the most romantic destinations in the world. Isn't that something you wouldn't necessarily think of it, but uh, no, it I know be. it's kind of kind of unusual because the men there are men. That's why, <laughs> and the sheep are nervous. <laughs> oh, that, that's New Zealand, isn't it, or Texas? Anyway, uh, well, you even mentioned Paris. Is that too cliched to be romantic? I mean, with the Eiffel Tower and all of the amazing food and the you know small streets and things like that. Yes, it's cliche, but it's cliche for a reason because it's. Mm. It, it is um, a great place to just stroll along the streets with the um, lights strung up at night. It's, I mean, it's beautiful. The city of light. How about, uh, how about Italy? Mm. Um, yeah, Italy is very romantic. I'd say it's romantic because I took my honeymoon there. Oh. I went to Rome and Florence and Venice. And, um, you know, it's just one of those places that's just iconic, iconically beautiful. Um, there's cozy little B&Bs that you can stay in. Um, it's what... I would recommend you can get a romantic breakfast for two. Some places even bring breakfast right to your room every morning. So how about that? Never even having to get out of the bed. You open up the window and you see just um, all these Italian buildings and people who are just gorgeous. And it's a wonderful place to, to fall in love or to rekindle some of that. Dr. Chrysler, just a change of venue can put spark back into a relationship, even if you're going down the street to the motel, isn't it true? I just got off a lecture. Or the back seat of a car. <laughs> yeah. I just got off a lecture tour. I started in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and then oh, went yeah. to West Palm Beach, Brazil. And then to Orlando, and then to Mexico City. And I can tell you that American women are by far the most beautiful. Well, right. you're such a suck up. Brazilian <laughs> women. I thought Brazilian and Lebanese were ranked, were uh, fighting for the number one and number two spot right now, as I'm told. Right now, yes. <laughs> um, now, Allison, before we let you go, and remember, you can get your romantic vacation any time of year at deltavacations.com. That's where you can get even advice on where to go. What's the least romantic place you can think of? Uh, as a destination? Yeah. Um, I... <laughs> My grandparents' house in Arizona. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking Flint. That could be a bit of a buzzkill. How about, how about I was thinking Flint, too. <laughs> uh, doctor, uh, would you hold up the rose to the microphone there and uh, give Allison our uh, Valentine's Day send-off there? Just hold it right up there. This is for you, dear. I love you. You got that, Allison? There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Happy Valentine's Day to you. We're going to give you a couple of Michigan destinations for romance as soon as we get back in the last segment of our Romance Hour. It's 14 before the hour. Michael Patrick Shields. Well, you don't have to guess. We'll have them say their name and where they're from right now, our romance experts. Dwayne Gill, Lance. You can see him on stage. Do you have a website? Yes, I do. DwayneGill.com. Uh, DwayneGill.com. It's got all my upcoming dates. I'm going to be at Firekeepers Casino March 23rd. And, you uh, are. I'll be at Connections in June. But uh, just a, a little plug, Connections this week, uh, Dave Coulier. Oh, that's right. Yeah, Uncle Joey, right, at Connections. So uh, He's going to be in the program tomorrow with us, in fact. Absolutely. Thank you. Comedian to comedian. And, sir? Dr. John Christopher from AllThingsMail.com. AllThingsMail.com. He can put the... What'd you say? The roar back in your lion? Restore the roar. Restore the <laughs> roar in the bedroom and beyond. And sir? Matt Rhodes from Dusty Cellar, and you know, Dwayne gets to announce his date, so I'm at Dusty's every day. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget to tip your waiters and waitresses. That's right, yeah. <laughs> DustyCellar.com with the romantic wine you need for the weekend, sir. Uh, Michael McFarland, Firekeeper's Casino. And, uh, You're executive chef, right? I am executive chef. And we know the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Absolutely. Or oysters or any of the other. Foie gras, the aphrodisiacs. And uh, madam? Katrine Madouar of Madouar Jewelers in Lansing in Okemos, Jackson, and Portage. Should have said mademoiselle, not madam. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. <laughs> Mike D'Agostino is with us from uh, uh, Traverse City. We were talking about romantic destinations, and Mike, you're with Grand Traverse Resort. I would say if you uh, sit up in the top of the tower and watch the sun go down on the East Bay, that's pretty romantic, isn't it? That is very romantic. And uh, The food that's up on the 16th floor in Airy Restaurant at Grand Traverse Resort is uh, amazingly romantic as well. You put together a romantic uh, weekend opportunity, have you not? 
Absolutely. Um, we have some wonderful packages for, uh, for this weekend. Uh, we also have some wonderful events coming up for the remainder of winter uh, that can add a spark of romance to your life because it's something different. What was the most romantic moment in the history of your life? Me, personally? Yes, you. Hmm. Well, I would have to say getting married, the moment that my wife and I exchanged vows at the altar, that was a really, really romantic moment, and I can't think of anything that would have uh, would top that. Wow, that's where, where did that take place, and how many years ago? Uh, that was at St. Patrick's Church in Escanaba, Michigan, and uh, well, that was well over 26 years ago. That was 1983. J. Mike D'Agostino, uh, let's reenact that for you right now, since that was your most romantic moment of your life. Amanda Wall, could you run in here? You're a newlywed. You were just married two years ago to Mike McGarry. Um, and what's your wife's name, Mike? Patty. Patty. <laughs> Patty, do you take Mike to be your lawful wedded husband for richer or poorer, sickness and health for all the days of your life? I do. She does. Mike, do you take Patty to be your lawfully <laughs> wedded wife to obey and obey, and obey, and obey all the days of your life. You betcha, eh? <laughs> <laughs> See you at Grand Traverse Resort. He's married again, J. Mike D'Agostino and Patty, after all these years. Pop down now to uh, Tullymore Resorts, because you heard him say he was married in St. Patrick's Church. So the Irish name Tullymore, we were talking about what a romantic place Ireland is just a few minutes ago. Terry Sheber is the new CEO of Tullymore. Happy Valentine's Day to you. Terry, are you there? Not connected. Anyway, we'll try to get back with him then if we can at uh, six minutes before the hour. The most ra romantic moment of your life. Quickly, let's go around the table. Okay, Dwayne Gill. Start over there. No. Should we? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll go the other way. No, no, I'll tell you. Yeah. One of the most romantic time of my life, uh, when I first date with my wife, uh, uh, we were in Detroit, and we were downtown, and uh, had a nice picnic at Shane Park, and watched a concert, and that's one of the most romantic times I can definitely remember. Oh, that's nice. Thank you, Dr. John. Far, far too one. All right. Uh, well, yeah, oh, but he's, uh, so oh, he's so smooth. <laughs> I'm not talking about last week. I'm talking about your whole whole life. Well, we just let that go with that. <laughs> okay, if you insist. So I thought the deal with Amanda said I come on again this year, but this question was not allowed. But oh, you had so, time to prepare. I'll think of something fun. You know, it's my a wife trap, and I man. were up and yeah, we're up in the UP on the coastline. We took a bottle of wine down to the beach. We finally got it open. And realized we didn't have any glasses. Oh. But we did have the lid to the carrier for the wine, so we poured it into the lid and drank out of that. <laughs> had a wonderful yeah. time. You, you had a the, loving cup. Lake Shore, yes. That's what that's called. Chef. Uh, probably walking through the cloisters in the Bahamas and then down to Cabbage Beach and then up along the, uh, up along the beach towards Atlantis. Uh, Naked? Uh, just a small, well, thong. So. <laughs> there goes that T word again. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah, it was. Uh, they've got beautiful gardens there uh, yeah. by the one and only Ocean Club. And yeah, it was just uh, it was a beautiful afternoon. Yeah, that I've been. I'm lucky to have been there a couple of times. They used it in the James Bond movie, um, the uh, last one with Pierce Brosnan there. Or no, it was the, the first Casino one. Casino Royale. Casino Royale. Yeah. They used the Ocean Club in that picture. Yeah, they did. Katrine Medawar, your most romantic moment. Well, I've had so many. I, like John, have had the opportunity to go many places. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I must say that a carriage ride on Mackinac Island was probably the most uh, romantic moment yeah. for me after I got married 25 years ago. That is a very romantic setting. And your daughter was married there, too. That was a very Absolutely. romantic setting as well. Amanda Wall, you've been married two years. Is the bloom off the rose? Is it the honeymoon oh, still on? Oh, the honeymoon's always on. Is it? <laughs> in, your, in your short life, what's the most romantic moment? Uh, the moment that we got engaged. You were on the bluffs we of on, uh, Sleeping Bear? On top of Sleeping Bear Dunes, and uh, right after he proposed, all these little kids started clapping from down below, and it kind of felt like a movie. It was sunset, and it was really special. All right, there you have it. Uh, Michael, what about you? Yes. Gosh, we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Just kidding. Uh, you can read about them on TravelTatler.com. I'll put them all there. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Thank you very much Happy for being Valentine's. with us. Thank you. We love you all. It's uh, three minutes before the hour. More of your Thursday with Michael Patrick Shields.